everyone. Welcome back to the Unnatural Thoughts Halloween broadcast. Uh, we're here with Jared, Ben, and I'm Shannon. And today we're going to be giving you uh, a few short episodes, about 10 minutes each, um, where we profile some fictional uh, serial killers from the horror movies. We're going to be going over the first Friday the 13th film. We're going to be going over the second Friday the 13th film. We're going to be going over Halloween, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Scream, and Nightmare on Elm Street. Did I miss any? I don't think so. All right. Nope. And the way we're going to be doing this is we're going to be presenting profiles based on if we were investigators in the actual films. And we're only going to base these off of the first films or uh, in Friday the 13th's case, uh, since there's two killers, uh, Mrs. Voorhees and Jason. Uh, Jason's in the second. Um, we're going to do those two films, uh, but we're going to base it off of if we were actually investigators looking into the murders in each of these films so we have we're going off of absolutely no knowledge of the uh follow-up films or the reboots or anything like that we're going off of just the films we'll be talking about so first yeah. on our first on our list is friday the 13th the original the first one yes miss Voorhees. You're not you're not supposed to say that, Jared. We're not. I thought we was. <laughs> no. I, didn't know. I saw. It. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. All right. All right. So we're going over Friday the 13th, the first one. A little bit of background information on this case. A young boy drowned in Crystal Lake during the summer of 1957. In the summer of 1958, two counselors, Barry Jackson and Claudette Hayes snuck inside a storage cabin to have sex where an unseen assailant murdered them. Uh, about what is it? About 20 years later? Um, well, anyway, in, in yeah, in about, uh, about 1920 years later, 1979, the summer of 1979, yeah. uh, several others were killed. At the same camp, uh, we have Barry Jackson, a counselor at Camp Crystal Lake, uh, late teens, early 20s, who was uh, stabbed in the stomach with a hunting knife. Claudette Hayes. Oh, no, wait a minute. Those were the first two. Um, all right, so let me, let me take this off a minute. This is getting a little difficult for me. Yeah. <laughs> all right, it was much cool, better. though. <laughs> All right, so we have Annie Phillips, who is a cook at Camp Crystal Lake. Uh, late teens, early 20s was her age range. Uh, she was slashed in the throat with a hunting knife. Ned Rubenstein, who is also a counselor at Camp Crystal Lake, uh, he was in his late teens, early 20s. Uh, most of these victims were in their late teens, early 20s. We don't know an exact age on them, but... Uh, his throat was slashed with a hunting knife as well. Uh, Jack Burrell, another counselor, late teens, early 20s. Uh, neck, he was impaled through the neck with an arrow. Marsha Stanler, another camp counselor, late teens, early 20s, um, was struck in the face with an axe. Uh, Steve Christie was a renovator and owner of, the new, of Camp Crystal Lake. Um, he was in his mid thirties to the early forties stabbed in the chest with a hunting knife. Then there was a camp counselor named bill who was in his, I want to say early twenties. Yeah. Uh, his throat was slashed with a hunting knife and then he was impaled through multiple places with arrows. Uh, finally there's Brenda, another camp counselor, late teens, early twenties. Um, her cause of death is unknown, unknown, but it appears that her body was thrown through a window of one of the uh, camping uh, 
camping cabins. Uh, there ha was, however, one survivor, a female counselor, uh, late teens, early 20s, by the name of Alice Hardy. Uh, right now, she is incoherent. So we can't really get a whole lot of information from her. Oh, wow. What are your guys' thoughts on this? Uh, my thoughts are it seems like the killer doesn't really have a specific way of killing. Uh, it seems like they are using what they used, whatever they could was close or possibly could get their hands on. Um, improvising, like you said, uh, the one of the girls was thrown through a window. It seemed okay. So, Ben, what are your yeah. thoughts? Uh, you know, I, I think uh, the interesting thing here is that within all of those multiple different methods of, of dispatching people, uh, all of them really could have been done by anybody. There's none of these murders would have, it, it wouldn't have taken somebody particularly strong or uh, particularly large or anything like that to, to be able to commit these murders mm -hmm. uh, as they were. So it kind of opens up the field as to the suspect list. Right. Uh, now, what we're dealing with here is a mass murderer. This isn't a, your typical serial killer uh, or even a spree killer. Uh, there's no real, um, nothing that to suggest there's any type of cooling off period. Um, nothing really to suggest that they were on a, just a killing spree. This Dang. was one location, uh, a mass murder. All these uh, murders happened over the course of one night. Oh, wow. Um, it looks <clears throat> as if they were blitz style attacks. Mm -hmm. um, personal cause homicide, likely. Yeah, um, revenge homicide for sure. Yeah. Uh, likely a hunter or someone who had a grudge against the camp and its counselors. Mm -hmm. uh, the killer is likely someone who couldn't win a fair fight. So, probably on the smaller size, um, given the, the way in which they killed people. Uh, you know, you had arrows, uh, you had surprise attacks with a knife. Um, so it's uh, likely that their age range would be mid-30s to early 40s, possibly, uh, given the time frame in between these murders and the previous. Um, mass murderers are generally ordinary people who just snap. Uh, so All the right. reopening of the camp could have set them off. Ah, the yeah. stressor, right? The reopening of the camp and, and mm -hmm. teenagers showing up and all of it caused this person to, to snap. Right. Mm -hmm. Flashbacks, possibly making them think that, uh, that it was back then. Right. Do you now, know what I would do? Yeah. I'll tell you what I would do first if I was the cops. The first thing I'd look at is anyone who might have a grudge against the camp or the counselors that work there, I'd go back through the history of the camp and sort of look at any stories that came out or um, anything that might have happened there that stood out in the number of years preceding these murders to see, you know, if there's something that matches this. Right. And since there was a young boy that drowned there in 1957, uh, the That's following true. summer, uh, the two camp counselors who were on duty when that boy drowned were were murdered the following summer. The following Whoa. summer, okay. Yes. Wow. So, so do you, you think, think the, do you think these three cases could have been related? It could be. It yeah. sounds if if the two okay. counselors that were supposed to be watching this kid that drowned was killed mm -hmm. the following summer. It, could it be possibly a parent or a guardian? Would you say? I don't know. We don't. We don't know if we don't know who the boy was really. Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. We know his name was Jason. That's all we know. Jason. We don't know. Oh, we don't wow. know a last name. We don't know. Right. Um, we don't know if he was. Uh, if he really had any parents. All right. He was a severely disformed boy. Oh. So I mean. Oh. I that's really all we know. We right. know that Did, the boy drowned. Say, the boy drowned because these two camp counselors went off and weren't really watching him like they were right. supposed to. 
And uh, they it doesn't say if they discovered the body or not or anything like that. No. Oh wow. Yeah. Um. So they pretty so much. Then, <clears throat> sorry. So then the camp was closed after these two counselors were murdered the following summer. Is that right? Right. And right. then reopened, what, 25, 20 years later? About, tw- about 20 years later. Uh, they the were mur- the started. two counselors were murdered in 1958. Uh, mm-hmm. Then it was reopened to be renovated in the summer of 1979. Okay. Wow. So um, do you think, it's, I wonder if it's a possibility that whoever committed the murders could have lived close by? It's possible. As well. Yeah, as well. certainly was familiar with the area. I mean, and with everything going on, uh, seems you know, maybe maybe they just wanted to keep that camp closed. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking, given the use of a hunting knife, it's likely a hunter. Um, you know, a lot a lot of people hunt in the area. It's around a lot of woods. Mm. Um, and given the fact that. Uh, one at least one of the counselors was uh penetrated several times with arrows uh, it would have to be someone who was uh really um familiar with archery really so, proficient with those kinds of weapons right right, right. uh in fact uh one of them, one of the victims was actually impaled through the neck with an arrow so yeah. the the killer would have to be a, very, a really good shot with a bow and arrow. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, um, there's there's not a lot of uh, uh, margin for error with an arrow. True. So, although uh, unless the arrow is being used as a stabbing stabbing implement, as opposed to with the bow, perhaps if the person stabbed from underneath. You're looking at someone of small stature who would be able to fit underneath a bed and not be noticed. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And back in those days, uh, beds, especially campy, would probably be like a, a cot. Yeah. Style. Right. right. So they so they definitely have to be uh, small in size. Smaller, that's for sure, because you're looking at a small space under the bed. You're not looking at a big brawny guy, because I think you'd be able to tell he was lying underneath one of those. Oh, things. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. All right, so we're out of time for this one. <laughs> Ten minutes. Ten minutes, all right. that's all we're allowed for each one. Okay. Nope. Perfect. So uh, let me set a new one. Oh, Deadpool, you're so true. Oh, hey, guys, what's up? Uh, Double J here. Just here to remind you, Masters of the Geekverse is making a comeback. We're going to be moving to YouTube. We're going to be talking about a lot more stuff. So stay tuned and get your geek on. Have a good one, guys. All right, this next one is from the film Friday the 13th 2. Um. Okay. The survivor from the mm-hmm. previous uh, incident at Camp Crystal Lake. This takes place. Uh, this happened two months later. Oh, right. yeah. oh, very, wow. very close together. Uh, the the uh, survivor from the previous one, uh, from the previous uh, mass murder, uh, she was killed in her home two months later. Oh, yeah, uh, with an ice pick. Dang. So you're talking about Dang. someone with a lot of strength there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then five years after that, uh, a new summer training camp for counselors was being opened down the road from Camp Crystal Lake, uh, which is now, de- by that point, is now deserted and dilapidated, uh, called Camp Pakanak. Uh, one of the vi- victims was a town crazy um, who constantly ca- talked about Camp Blood you know, uh, his name was Ralph and he was strangled to death with barbed wire. So that's going to take a lot of strength too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, man. Officer deputy, uh, Winslow, uh, he was stabbed in the head with a claw hammer. Man, You'd have to take some, that takes some serious power to be. Yeah. Yeah. Wedge, uh, a claw hammer in somebody's head. Right. 
Uh, these other camp counselors, uh, they didn't, uh, no one really knows their last names, uh, except for a couple of them. But uh, there was one, a male subject, uh, a male victim uh, by the name of Scott. His throat was slashed. Uh, weapon looks to be a machete, maybe, or a rather <laughs> large uh, knife. Uh, Mark, another male victim, uh, face struck with a machete. Uh, judging by the size of the uh, slash in, in their faces is, is likely a machete. Uh, another male victim, Jeff, uh, he was impaled through the back with a spear. Uh, and then uh, another camp counselor, Sandra Deer. Uh, she was impaled through the chest with a spear. Um, then another one by the name of Vicky, who was repeatedly stabbed with a knife. Um, the next two, their manner of deaths is unknown. Uh, there is one name by the name of Terry. And then uh, Paul Holt, who is the head counselor, uh, his cause of death was also unknown. What are your thoughts? Uh, uh, it sounds like a revenge killing again, like this. Yeah. this but, but with one major difference, this this perpetrator is clearly male, and I say that because uh, unless she's a bodybuilder, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, th this killer is definitely a male and a big male right. at that. And we know for a fact that the person who per perpetrated the other killings did not perpetrate these killings because. Uh, Allison or Alice Hardy, uh, after she became coherent and she was able to tell the police what happened, uh, it turned out the killer from two months ago was Pamela Voorhees, uh, the cook of the of Camp Crystal Lake back in the, the cook back hmm. in uh, 1957. And oh. she was the mother of the boy who drowned. Oh, there you go. That makes sense. Ding, ding, ding. So, do you yep. think maybe the killer of this one might have been her husband? Possibly. Maybe getting revenge for like her death or yeah. uh, hers and her son's murders? Maybe. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this, wow. this killer sounds more brutal, though. Um, yeah. Definitely has a lot of strength. That's for sure. Definitely. Especially with the ice pick. The ice exactly. pick, the strangling with barbed wire. Yeah. Barbed wire, that's just um, wow. even putting, getting it, but enough momentum to get a spear through someone's uh, chest and back. Uh, it looks like um, whoever it was, uh, according to records, uh, it was actually to th through both people at the same, uh, same time. Wow. They were. In the throes of lovemaking on a one of the cot one of the bunks, and they came up from uh, I can't remember if it was from underneath or from overhead, and just penetrated them both. So this person had to have a lot of strength. That's some farmer strength right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jeez. Wow. Uh, eat, but somebody that big, you think they hear move? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it seems like and, unless they're a hunter. Just like with the previous theory, right. um, hunters can kind of are uh, supposed to move pretty silently, yeah, uh, so they don't scare away their uh, prey. And then when uh, you think about size, like uh, I think I, whenever I think size and and murderers, I automatically go to Ed Kemper. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the biggest serial killers to ever uh, to ever do it. You know, uh, the only difference was. He picked up these the co-eds in his car and took them to secluded places and killed them there. That's right. Uh, you know, he didn't have to sneak up on them or anything. This feels more like uh, these people are trespassing on his land at the same time as there's a revenge aspect. Like it, it feels like he that's like his like it was the worst idea to build another camp on that dang lake. You right. know, like, right. why didn't they just leave it alone? It's starting know? to right. sound cursed. Right. <laughs> um, so for my profile, um, for this, it's five years later. Um, I mean, Alan, Miss Hardy was killed two months after the previous murders. 
And then five years after that is when uh, this all happened. So I don't think we're dealing with a serial killer here. It sounds more like um, maybe a mass murder or spree killer, possibly. Uh, mm-hmm. Alice definitely seemed like a revenge killing. Yes. So I'm kind of leaning towards um, Pamela Voorhees' husband. S- uh, same. It just yeah. it's it's too it's too close to home kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Like they killed my wife. Now it's it's their turn. Right. Yeah. You the know? only other, yeah the only other thing that would make sense would be the, the son if the son was still alive, but he's right. not. That was right. the whole point of her making all those murders was that he drowned. Yeah. So. Right. Um, also, since there is such a huge gap between Alice Hardy's murder and the these other murders um i'm almost thinking hers was revenge and then maybe a copycat of pamela Voorhees came out and uh killed these others uh right. to kind of continue her legacy almost yes it's it, that's definitely what it sounds like to me um it's just man they just this one seems like last one didn't work i'm gonna teach you some people to stay clear of my camp my life right. my exactly my land yeah you know um, but but and like i said i i really feel this individual was a man uh be, just because of the sheer strength it would have taken uh to commit some of these murders uh mm-hmm. possibly a hunter likely someone connected to the first group of killings yeah 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 that makes perfect sense <laughs> yeah i mean it's just it's just too, like I said, it's too close to home not to be connected. Right. I mean, the, the original killer well, that might be dead, but some somebody's taken over. Right. Um, all right, I think that'll do it for that one. We're about okay. a minute shy of 10 minutes. Oh, that's so. not bad. Yeah. Hi, I'm S.M. Cornthwaite. There's a creepy new book series out for the young one in your life or the young at heart. Check out Hollow Screams, Day of the Dolls, and Hollow Screams, Ghost House, now available on Amazon. Read them together. These tales are thrillers. All right, the next one is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh. Uh, so in 1974, uh, Sally Hardesty uh, and her paraplegic brother Franklin, along with their friends Jerry, Kirk, and Pam, told their family and friends they were going to visit the grave of the Hardesty's grandfather to investigate reports of vandalism and grave robbery. Oh, wow. um, the bodies of these uh, individuals were found at the old Hardesty farm uh, homestead, uh, which was nearby. Uh, so they decided, likely decided to go check it out. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you know, they, um, it was probably their grandfather's homestead. Um, but uh, let's see, Kirk was bludgeoned in the head with a sledgehammer. Uh, forensics indicate he was also hacked apart with a chainsaw. Mm. Mm. Uh, Pamela um, was impaled through the back on a meat hook and left frozen in the freezer. So there was power going through this house in order to be able to operate the freezer, which shouldn't have been since it's long been abandoned. You know, um, Jerry, he was bludgeoned in the head with a sledgehammer. Uh, Franklin Hardesty was hacked five times with a chainsaw. Wow. Do you know the power that, that like... That's oh, yeah. a powerful dude, man. To take a sledgehammer to somebody's head and oh, yeah. that much with the chain. Good lord. Yeah. Uh, I we're not sure if our investigators aren't really sure if this one is related or not. Uh, but there was another uh, killing not too far away. Um, a hitchhiker uh, who was run over by an eighteen wheeler. Oh, man. That kind of seems like an accident, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But like the, that might have given been... the fact that it's so close together, we can't really rule out that right. it was intentional either. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Man. What are your guys' thoughts? Uh, that it seems like whoever did these killings had to be a big, big, big person, strong and steady. You know, just because a sledgehammer and a chainsaw that yeah. chainsaw is brutal. Yeah, and we don't know the size of the sledgehammer either. You That's know, true. They, That's they, true. They come in multiple sizes, uh, mm-hmm. but given the amount of damage, it, it had to be a kind of pretty heavy one. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, the, uh, right away, my gut sort of thing, the, the, the method of killings all over the place, which kind of mm-hmm. tells me the, the, you know, the choice of how to kill is based on what's happening in the moment and what's around and what he's got, he, and I definitely say he, this doesn't feel no. like a female crime mm-hmm. one way or the other, but uh, I, I know, you know, I'm sure we have our fair share up here in Canada, but I know down in the States in back countries like backwoods, West Virginia, backwoods, Texas, there's right. a lot of old um, families. And this uh, did happen in, in Texas. Long way. Right. Oh, and it this, happened in Texas, right? This did happen in oh, Texas. Oh, okay. Oh, so, yeah, so then... You know, you're looking at the, the, if it was if it was rural, we're talking, you know, possibly old families, maybe with a little bit of inbreeding, you know, uh, oh, yeah, oh, for sure. Definitely in the south. The south is pretty yeah. notorious for inbreeding. Yeah, it yeah. Is. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> I'm I'm willing to bet that this was. Just simply put, a mass murder, um, just like the other ones, likely trespassing, or yeah. uh, felt that they were trespassing. Um, being that it was at the uh, Hardesti's family home, um, that's been long abandoned. I'm I'm gonna th- say that um, whoever did this was likely squatting in the uh, homestead and mm. didn't want to be forced to leave. Uh, but it really feels like um, it, it feels brutal. Like, yeah, you know, they, they, whoever did this took possession and claimed that land, that yeah. property. Damn and man. they didn't want literally to be by anyone. anyone that came on. Yeah. Was there anything weird found at the crime scenes besides the bodies or anything? Um, the basement was full of other body, um, bodies. We don't, uh, investigators at this point aren't clear if the remains found are animal or human, Oh wow! but there were like, there were wind chimes made out of bones. Wow. Um, there, there were definitely some animal parts down there, uh, Mm. but Forensics haven't yet come back on the others. Right. Do you think it could have been some kind of like a cannibalistic family kind of thing? Who knows that far out? It's always in possible. The, in the wilderness. Yeah. I mean, they had her in a freezer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if there's other bones, right. I mean, what's happened to the meat, the skin? And the fact that uh, the same girl who was found in the freezer was actually impaled on a meat hook, you know. The fact that they had a meat hook down there. Yeah. You know, that sounds like he was about to they, clean a deer or something. <laughs> they were yeah. likely butchers of some some kind. If yeah, they had that's... meat hooks and uh chainsaws in order to be able to cut through bone like that and large enough freezers to be able to hold a human body. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I I'm I'm leaning towards some kind of cannibalism thing yeah maybe you know uh, wow so fan some people who just squatting in this land who take advantage of basically anybody who happens to unfortunately tread on this property they wind up becoming dinner yeah uh it was also um you tell me where that was i want to make sure i never 
<laughs> as far as I, uh, it doesn't give the actual uh, city or township or anything, uh, just somewhere in Texas, rural Texas. Uh, but the sheriff went missing out there at one one point. Um, his his wife hadn't heard from him in, in quite a while. Yeah. Wow. So they don't care who you are, then, probably. Right. I mean, um, you know, if if he went out there, who knows? Yeah. They could. I will never go to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Texas That's, or Arkansas. Yeah, oh, man. Arkansas, yeah. <laughs> there right, goes my vacation plans. We're about two minutes into that one. All it right. seemed like we're coming up on uh, going in circles on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, ben, did you get the uh, victims from Nightmare on Elm Street done? I did. Right. I did. So, so basically... Um, first victim uh this was on uh, a street called elm street we know that it was um the first victim was a girl named tina gray high school girl um high school senior this took place in uh sorry hang on i think 1980 one sec <clears throat> 1984 was when the events of of this happened so the first victim was a girl named Tina Gray, who was at a friend's house, um, a girl named Nancy. Uh, they were having a sleepover okay. and uh, Tina was <coughs> murdered in front of her boyfriend with some kind of multi knived implement. Uh, and he, to this day, he claimed, uh, well, I, at that point, he claimed that he couldn't see who was doing this to her. Uh. So in the end, they found her, her body had been slashed by multiple blades and, um, her boyfriend, Rod Lane was arrested for her murder and taken to jail. Now, was in it more? Was it multiple blades or was it one blade several times? They, they, they seem to think it's multiple blades because of the way in which the, uh, the, the multiple wounds went in, in exact, the, the, the way they described the wounds themselves, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have been that precise if they mm -hmm. were not, uh, you know, made by a machine or something that was holding all five of these blades. And or like an animal. Before. Yeah, it's like, like a claws. claw from an animal, but but sharp, like really razor sharp. So mm. <clears throat> anyway, her boyfriend, Rod, is arrested for this and put in jail. But while he's in jail, he apparently hangs himself in his cell. So uh, it kind of goes um, a little bit cold until a, a day or two later when their friend, Glenn Lance is murdered in his bed. All they found of him was blood. That's all that was in the room. He was gone. Um, the the yeah. bed was was a mess, and there was just blood everywhere. Um, and uh, the last victim in this series was a woman named Marge Thompson, who was uh, slashed and pulled through a window and uh, just, yeah, it was, it was brutal. That takes but a it lot was of strength. All, yeah. yeah. But how it was big, all how in big was the window? period of time. Uh, we're talking like a, um, probably like a, not a bay window, but maybe slightly smaller than that on a second floor kind of thing. Oh, wow. What? So. Jeez. Now the, the way you described the blades, that sounds mm. very familiar. Uh, mm. Wasn't there a child killer uh, way back when who used blades like that? Like yeah, on a so club or something, was, right? Many years ago in that town, there was a, a, a child killer named Fred. Kruger, who 
murdered some of the local townspeople's children. And in a rage, the town banded together, all the, the adults banded together, cornered him in a warehouse and burned him in the furnace. Okay. Incinerated him in the furnace. Oh, man. So the odd thing here is that these murders seem to be somehow almost in an anniversary type situation. And the at least Tina experienced um, blade slashes very similar to some of the children victims of Fred Krueger. And the way uh, Fred Krueger was a child killer, right? Yes. What we know about child killers is they're generally pedophiles. Yeah, that's right. They they aren't they don't just kill children. They actually sexually abuse them before and before. after they kill them. Yeah. Um, so he was likely a lust killer too, as well as a pedophile. Oh yeah. It, if I'm not mistaken, he did get go to court for this, but it was like a mistrial, wasn't it? Like yeah. there wasn't enough evidence or something, or, they, or there was the the evidence was obtained improperly or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah, I remember and, hearing about that. Yeah, same. And yeah, the the townspeople thing was yeah, like them getting their justice. So, so maybe, like, maybe do you know who the parents copy. were that uh, killed this Kruger? So yeah, as it turns out, they were the parents of Tina Gray, Rod Lane. Ooh. Glenn Lance, uh, Marge Thompson, and of course Nancy. Um, it but sounds Nancy to me like a revenge lie. killing. Yeah, absolutely. maybe but he absolutely. had, maybe he had a kid. Um, and the fact that uh, were they all killed in their sleep, or at least where they were alone? Yes, uh, except in the case of. Tina Gray, uh, where <clears throat> Rod, um, before he hung himself in the cell, which now the question is, did Rod in fact actually hang himself or did something else happen to him? Man. Rod maintained that they were making out in the bedroom and the next thing he knew, she was dragged up the wall by something he couldn't see hmm. and held on the ceiling, then see, dragged me, across the ceiling and then he saw these red marks appear on her on her stomach and she fell to the bed so this this is his what? recollection see to me that sounds like he was he killed her yeah right. that, that's, that's what it sounds like to me these yep. others however um the the fact that they died while they were asleep or were killed while they were sleeping tells me this this person wasn't really i he wanted to uh, blitz attack him. He didn't. Yeah. Really, he didn't think he could uh, basically hold his own otherwise. Um, yeah, somehow, that's the only way he could get to them is when they're asleep. I just, you know, this is the easiest way. Right. And usually, with blitz attack uh, killers, they're generally smaller, weaker than the victims. Um, mm. a, a lot of times, they're deformed too because. Uh, they don't want some uh, their victims to see them. Mm. Uh, All right. so, so, so they killed they killed Fred Truger in, in a, a furnace. You said correct? Yes. No. So, uh, they he well, maybe went, not a furnace. They they trapped him in a building and then oh, threw Molotov cocktails in it. There. Yeah. That's right. That's totally, mm. that's right. That's what it was. So was was there? Did they ever discover Fred's body? I don't, I don't believe so. Man, did he have any it children? Just, uh, not that we're aware of, no, or at least because not this, that investigators were aware of. This sounds like it could be a relative of Kruger's, one yeah. in revenge, or even a Kruger sympathizer, someone who looked up to him, maybe wanted yeah, to copycat him. Yeah, but totally. the fact that these were teenagers, um, maybe not necessarily a copycat, maybe someone trying to finish what he started. Yeah, it also sounds like revenge because you said that the parents that trapped him in the building was their kids were coming up, the yeah. ones that died. Yeah, so it definitely he was definitely somebody was out for revenge. 
Were there uh, any survivors? Uh, Nancy, um, I can't remember her last name, Loomis, I think, or uh, Nancy, okay. uh, Nancy was the last uh, survivor. She, okay. she managed to survive. Ha, ha, has she given any statements or anything? Yeah, but a lot of it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, okay. You know, she, she, she claims that they were being attacked in their dreams. Um, but, uh, you know, who knows? Right. Wow. What the heck? That's right, we're insane. out of time on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to stick to the whole 10 minute rule. So we're not at oh, this it's all good, night. Bro. Yeah, it's a good rule. <laughs> all right. The next one is scream. Scream. Okay. All right. 10 minutes so, on the clock now. All right. So in 1998, um there was a murder of a cheerleader named casey becker she was a very well-known girl she and her boyfriend she was um a home alone and her boyfriend steve orth was coming over to visit um and at some point during the night steve was gutted and left on the patio in a patio chair tied to a patio chair Casey was found by her parents hanging from a tree with her insides coming out oh, all wow. over the, the ground in front of her. This began uh, a series of brutal killings that then followed with Arthur Himbry, who was the uh, he was the uh, principal of the local high school in. Um, Woodsboro, which is the town in which Woodsboro, California, in which is the town in which this happened. Yeah. Uh, he was stabbed in the school and found uh, as well after that, Tatum Riley, who was a member of this particular group of friends at this school, was, was killed by being crushed by a garage door. Uh, somehow, she managed to get caught in a, in a dog door that was built into the garage door uh, and the garage door crushed her. Was she kind of small or something? Because normally garage doors aren't that strong to be able to withstand that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how that happened, but I'll tell you, she, she was definitely tiny. She was a, a tiny girl. Uh, and then there was Kenny Jonas who worked for the um, Gail Weathers, the, uh, the news lady. He okay. was her cameraman. He was stabbed to death. He had his throat slit. Uh, and uh, that ultimately was the last victim until uh, the last two showed up were Stu Mocker. Stu was electrocuted. Okay. And Billy Loomis, who was shot in the head by mm -hmm. his girlfriend. Um. Uh, and, uh, she basically the, the, just to let you know, so that you, we know where to go forward with this exactly one year before these events, before Casey, one year before Casey Becker and Steve Orth were killed, mm -hmm. uh, Sydney Prescott, her mother, Maureen Prescott was murdered. Okay. They never caught who did it except that they thought they did because uh, the, the murder was pinned on a guy named Cotton Weary, who she'd been having an affair with. Oh, wow. And, uh, hmm. the, that's basically all they knew. And then all of a sudden, uh, these murders started happening. Okay. Man. So um, that's... Now, the last few, they happened at a party, didn't they? Wasn't they someone did. having a party and... So that to me screams mass murder, but these others kind of scream spree murder. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. nuts. And the cheerleader, I heard that they put her liver in a mailbox, correct? Oh, I, I, I don't. True. Yes. I believe yeah. that's true. Oh, wow. But yeah. I remember that. Um, uh, so the survivor was, was there a survivor? Yeah, Sydney Prescott, Maureen's daughter, uh, and and her father actually, as well as some of the other locals that were involved in the 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 party night. 
because ultimately the police were called to the party night. It was a mess. Um, and there were victims that were not killed. Um, there were victims that were wounded, like Deputy Dewey. Um, there were a few other people who were wounded, but never, never killed. They were all, they came through it all right. Was it the girl that was crushed by the garage? That was like uh, the deputy sister or something, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. thought so. That's uh, correct. That's insane. Yeah. Um, See, the, the, the MOs are all over the place in this. Yeah. All over. Um, it just, it's, almost, it's almost like it was more than one person. Yeah, like, it almost feels like yeah. It almost feels like it's it's all it's two things. It's it's a it's a, a like a a spree killer like um, for the excitement of it, and it's there's a revenge aspect or something right. else. To it. Now, like, from what I heard of this case, um, Sydney Prescott, the the survivor, she was actually being stalked by the killer before mm -hmm. before. Uh, the last few murders occurred. That's um, correct. He was, uh, the unsub was stalking and harassing her. Uh, they picked up her boyfriend for it, but yep. another call came through harassing her while he was in custody, right? While he was in custody. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Um, the fact that they were stalking and harassing Sydney tells me it was a personal cause lust murder. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Most personal cause murders, uh, you know, those those are for uh, someone who has a grudge against someone. Uh, the yep. fact that yep. it, I say lust murder is because most serial killers are lust murders. Yep. Um, and the fact that the first murders occurred about a year prior, that that. That kind of echoes back to the Camp Crystal Lake murders, too. Yeah. Yep. And you said the first one killed was Sydney's mom. That's right. right. Okay. So now witnesses also indicate uh, the unsub was wearing a Halloween costume. Yes. That resembled the scream painting by Robert or by uh, Edward Munch. Okay. Oh. Uh, okay. Um, so this, it sounds like uh, they wanted to kind of spread panic and fear in the small mm -hmm. town. Uh, yeah. And then, let's see here. Uh, it also kind of seems to make me believe they didn't want to be recognized. Yes. Um, in a small town like that, uh, everybody knew everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. uh, generally in small towns. So this would be someone from that town. Um, um, here's the thing. Um, I'll throw a little another tidbit that came out through the investigation that could help. Um, okay. Maureen Prescott had multiple affairs on oh. not just one. Wow. And one of those affairs happened to be Billy Loomis's mother or father. Sorry. Oh, wow. Oh, Billy See, Loomis's me, father. To me, that sounds like Sydney might be making this up that she was being stalked and harassed, and maybe, you know, possible. Maybe mm -hmm. the the one killing people. Um, what it? Now, she also stated that when she got the call, um, the unsub asked her what her favorite scary movie was. Mm -hmm. And who who was the first victim? Casey was, Becker was the first. Well, Steve Orth was the first one killed, but Casey Becker was the first one who actually received a phone call um, that was, I guess it was taped on their answering machine or whatever, but... Uh, I think she, she actually one. had her phone in her hand whenever her parents found her. Yeah. yeah. So I, right. I want to say the killer might have done the same thing to her, too. Uh, so yeah. that tells me that it's someone who's really big into scary movies. Yeah. Uh, the the Halloween costume, the connection with scary movies, the fact that most of the victims were teenagers, uh, and it revolved around this high school, um, along with uh, Sydney Prescott's mom, um, that that tells me it was likely a teenager. 
Right. I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards Sydney being the killer here. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting the feeling of, so Mrs. Prescott was murdered first. Um, I'm thinking maybe it was a revenge killing. And once they did that, they didn't get the satisfaction and they thought possibly maybe um, uh, to take out, it's, well, you said Sydney and her father survived, correct? Right. So they, it seemed like they killed the mom and then they didn't feel better about it. So mm-hmm. then it was like, I'm going to make the rest of the family suffer. Yeah. Right. And just went after uh, possibly friends is what it sounds like. You said it was a party. Well, mm-hmm. that's it. And and all of the people who died were were uh, um, friends of Sydney's. Oh, so they wanted to hurt her even more by killing her friends and yeah. then they possibly went after her or it, Sydney it's, just it's either personal or she did it herself. I think it's right. either someone's got a personal grudge against her or she is trying to make it look like that. Yeah, definitely. It's just, man. All right. Our time's up yeah. on that one, guys. Okay. We actually kind of went over a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Next is Halloween. Ben, you want to tell us a little bit about this? Okay. So um, I, I don't know if we want to do this one slightly differently. Yeah. We, uh, obviously, um, we know Michael Myers is the killer. Uh, yeah, we've got right. several reports. You know, he escaped from a, what was from a it, mental uh, institution that he was kept yeah. in. So, to give backstory so that we know what we're going with, um, when he was, I believe, nine years old or so, uh, Michael Myers stabbed his sister Judith Myers to death nine times in the chest. She was waiting for her boyfriend to, or her boyfriend had just left the house on Halloween and she was getting ready for bed. And when the parents came home, they found Michael standing outside in his clown costume with a bloody knife. From wow. that point forward, yeah, from that point forward, he was ensconced in a mental hospital being looked after by a Dr. Loomis. Um, uh, now, I've got here something a little bit different. Okay. Uh, Michael was six years old at the time. Six. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, age difference. Uh, he murdered his sister Judith in her bedroom on Halloween night in 1963 uh, where she sat at a beauty table in her bedroom uh, she was virtually naked uh, except for her panties uh, which kind of tells me that while her boyfriend was there they, they might have had intercourse to some extent uh, and the fact that she was supposed to be watching Michael at that time, he likely saw them, and it might have traumatized him. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's man. And in fact, evidence indicates that she did have sexual relations before her death. Uh, Fifteen years later, on October thirtieth, nineteen seventy-eight, uh, Michael's psychiatrist, Doctor Loomis, and his colleague Marion Chambers arrived at the sanitarium to escort Michael to court uh, for a hearing. Uh, however, when they arrived. Uh, the patient, several patients were wandering the grounds and Michael attacked nurse chambers while Dr. Loomis was messing with the gate and yeah. stole their car to escape Smith's Grove. Um, soon after this, uh, Dr. Loomis discovered the body of a mechanic uh, where he, he found uh, in his, the body in the truck uh, of the deceased uh, and stripped of all his clothing. Uh, with Michael's gown uh, hanging nearby. Um, Yeah. And then it said uh, there was a hardware store robbery in Haddonfield a short time later, and all that was taken was a Halloween mask, a knife, and some rope or something like that, wasn't there? What was the hearing supposed to be about? Like, was Uh, they about to possibly, like, release him? I think I they think, were going to transfer. Loomis him. was trying to get him committed for forever. Like, oh, never I was gonna say, the light of day. He would have been about 21 at the time, wouldn't he? Yeah. 
Yeah, somewhere uh, around there. Is, uh, this is I actually 15 years later. So, yeah, uh, yeah 21. Wow. And what that's I usually... Thinking about this is the, sorry, go ahead, Jerry. That's usually when... Uh, I think it's between 18 to 21 is usually when they release... Uh, like juveniles out of mm-hmm. you know juvenile right. detention or juvenile right. hospitals. That's right. So. so I think Loomis was trying to make sure that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then um, of course we have the series of murders in Haddonfield that happened, uh, starting with uh, the sheriff's daughter Annie Brackett, okay. who was had her throat slit. Uh, Bob Sims, who was stabbed and found impaled hanging from a cupboard in the kitchen in Annie Brackett's house, or uh, the, sorry, the house of the child that Annie was babysitting. Um, and the, the last victim was another friend of a girl named Lori Strode, who seemed somehow to be the, the focus of his attention here. Uh, Linda Vanderklok, she was stabbed, uh, or she was strangled rather, in her room uh, after Bob had left to go get a drink from the kitchen. Now, Lori Strode survived, correct? She did. And I- I've seen pictures of her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the statements she gave after she became coherent was that. Uh, That morning, she had stopped off by the Myers house, dropped off a key for her dad, who was going to sell the place. Uh, I guess he's a real estate agent or something like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, she began getting stalked by this guy in a white mask. Uh, She saw him outside her school, her classroom, Mm -hmm. and then uh, by some bushes. Mm -hmm. Uh, He passed her in a car, her and her friends. Uh, which we know now was Michael Myers. Yep. Uh, looking at a picture of Lori Strode compared to uh, Michael's sister, Judith, Judith? Mm. they look very similar. They do. Really? The, the fact that Lori stopped off at the Myers house, um, probably after Michael got to town, he was probably in his childhood home and he saw her and thought yeah. she looked a lot like his sister. Like he was in the childhood home. He actually, Dr. Loomis made a report that he found a half-eaten dog in the Myers residence. Happy uh, what? A half-eaten dog. And wow. when he found that, he said, I think Michael got hungry. Um, so he obviously killed and ate an animal while he was staying in the house. So Jeez. what I'm thinking, Shannon, now that you say that, is that Lori was totally in the wrong place at the wrong time, dropping mm-hmm. off that key. Mm-hmm. He saw her through the window and thought, that's my sister. It looks yep. like my that He, he wanted like to cute. finish the job from his child. Yeah. It was like, I didn't kill you the first time. I'm going to kill you now. Yeah. Right. And uh, now, oh, go ahead. And uh, it seems like he he went after her friends. Yeah. You know, and uh, man. To me, this so. screen. Now, you said the other, all, all the majority of the victims were babysitting that night, right? That's correct. Yeah. And Judith was babysitting Michael on Halloween night, right? Yep. And she had sex. Uh, he likely saw her and was traumatized. Um, it would seem that Michael is driven by the holiday Halloween. De- definitely, uh, the the murder of his sister was on Halloween. These murders mm-hmm. took place on Halloween. Mm-hmm. Uh, it kind of seems like he had a need to relive the night he killed Judith um, yeah. by taking victims around her age. Um, yeah. Like I said, it's likely that Michael witnessed his sister engaging in sexual acts. Yeah. As she was supposed to be babysitting him while their parents were out, uh, yeah. Judas was w- Judith was with her boyfriend who left shortly before she was murdered. Uh, this, for obvious reasons, likely scarred the boy. Yeah. Uh, when he returned home 15 years later, uh, he noticed Lori Strode uh, come up to the door of his childhood home, uh, which caught his attention and uh, began stalking her due to the resemblance to Judith. Um, now, at least that's what it looks like to me looking 
at the picture side by side of Judith and Lori, they they Spitting look in. very similar. Mm, right. um, which isn't unheard of, especially in small towns. You know, people are going to look, they're going to share resemblances. Right. Yeah. Uh, it sounds but, like to me that he just wanted to go home. Um, like he wanted to go home and then he saw Lori and was like, she's still alive, thinking that's Judith. Right. And that might have sent him back into the rage of killing him. Uh, Here's a, also, the other thing. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to add too when I was thinking about a profile for for Michael. Uh, I I don't know that I've ever heard of of a serial killer being launched solely by walking in on you know a, a family member having sex, but uh, there's the one years of Michael's life. Right. Were his parents like with him? The only thing we know is that they came home and found him with a bloody knife right. and had him you know, <laughs> put away. Uh, outside of that, we don't know anything about them. They could have been horrifically abusive and maybe they doted on the sister and like held her up as like the perfect child and he could never meet her, their expectations, but she right. always did. Right. She could do no wrong. Michael was always the bad kid who did all the bad stuff. And he just simmered in it until at six years old, he went, well, I'm going to get rid of my problem and killed his sister. Yeah. But Uh, being put away that long, like I I just, I feel like there's got to be some, maybe some abuse there and, you know, and and the way I see his uh, sister having sex kind of set him off. Yeah. Yeah. Because the way I see it is, is if if he would have seen a sister having sex, you'd think he'd go after the boyfriend. Because yeah. as six years old, you'd think he's hurting her or, you know, something like that. And he'd try to kill the boyfriend instead of his sister because that just doesn't make sense. Unless he already knew what this was and he'd already right. been through this before. And she's she's notorious for not taking care of him when the parents are out always yeah. having her boyfriend over for sex. Yep. It's almost yeah. like, it's almost a little bit like uh, Friday the 13th. Jason, in terms of being drowned and, you know, com- coming back and being like, you know, it's that same kind of mission of, you know, maybe he just assumed she didn't get killed that night. So I'm going yeah. back to finish what I started. Right. Yeah. And to me, it seems like while he was, while he was stalking Lori, uh, that he might have overheard the teen couples uh, either engaging in or planning relations with uh, for the evening while they were supposed to be babysitting. Yeah, uh, that yeah. kind of took him back to that night, also. Um, and then he saw Lori leave leave the kids. He was th- that she was babysitting. It, that caught yeah. his attention too. Absolutely, um, she was supposed to be babysitting these kids. And that kind of drew him back to that night also, reminded him of his sister, and he went after her. Yeah. Yep. Like, uh, he never heard any of the kids or anything, did he? No. Not that we know of. Not that we know of. That's true. Not that we know of. Right. Uh, I believe it was, like, uh, when they found Michael after he murdered his sister, they took the mask off and they said he looked traumatized. Like, uh, I can't believe I just did that kind of way. Wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's like some, maybe it's a multi-personality kind of thing. Maybe something. Uh, but else Dr. Loomis, over? Dr. Loomis said he looked into the boy's eyes when he first uh, came in contact with him mm-hmm. and saw these lifeless, emotionless eyes. Oh, wow. So wow. he Loomis thought he, the boy was pure evil. Well, I'll tell like you looking what, into the I, face of the devil. Yeah, yeah I you know what? The that tells me that Michael was a psychopath, at least as a child. Um, I was watching this show called Signs of a Psychopath, and they were interviewing this guy who had murdered his mom. And he was just basically like, Well, yeah, I mean. 
she was the source of my pride. I loved her in the way I knew. But if Michael had that predisposition, if he had psychopathy in there and the parents were not paying any attention to signs, he was probably doing harm to neighborhood animals up to the point right. that he was six. Right. Um, I think yeah. if you went back and looked at police reports and things prior to Judith's murder, you'd probably find garage has been set on fire um people's weird you know garbage cans cats pets going missing that kind of thing yeah um it makes you it makes you wonder uh since he went after his sister and uh you know one of the parents uh, like like shannon was saying you know mm. maybe she was uh held up higher or maybe I don't know. Um, nobody really knows much about the dad because, like, True. Mr. Myers. Right. Uh, yeah. But do you, if it was his actual dad or stepdad or anything like that. And, and this doesn't really scream serial killer to me. It seems more like a spree murder. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like it, or, or a, a crime of passion almost. Like, yeah. A, a, yeah. A it, family, family side. They say that um, spree kill, well, serial killers, you know, they kill people they're actually attracted to for the mm -hmm. most part, uh, yeah. men for with lust murders. But since Michael, act, so, since this actually kind of seems more like a spree killer, do we think he was attracted to Judith even at such a young age? Possibly, that, that could have been, rough. yeah. That could have been what sent him over to the edge after seeing her have sex. Oh, man. Is... If you, totally. If mm. he had, you know, uh, un, you know, inappropriate feelings about his sister yeah. and then walked in on her having sex, that would completely, uh, I could see that being a stressor in a heartbeat. Oh, absolutely. Right. Like she could have, uh, I mean, one way is she could have treated him like the best big sister in the world. And yep. he possibly took those feelings as I love my little brother. He's the greatest I, ever to, oh, she's in love with me too. Or, mm -hmm. And then once he's seen her having relations with her boyfriend, sent him into a rage of she doesn't love me like she says she does, which right. she wasn't, you know. So we're yeah. going to have to call it. We went way over our limit on this one. <laughs> oh this one was fun guys yeah oh yeah we we couldn't really hold back on this didn't really have to hold back on this one you know no. like we did the others um <laughs> and i that's pretty much all of them right i yep. think so all of them all right wasn't we gonna do chucky uh i don't oh, think oh, we had time we had talked about it but uh but that one yeah. we didn't even really have to do because we already knew he was charles lee ray right he was a serial killer in his own right <laughs> yeah. he just wanted to put his body in, or his soul in some other kid have, <laughs> have you guys been watching the the new uh chucky tv show no, no i'm waiting to. until they get all till it's all the great. episodes come out it, it's great it's 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 chucky uh, I love that Brad still got the tonsils after yeah. the lungs yeah. after all this time for that laugh. <laughs> Since so, the eighties, he's been doing that laugh. Oh, so do you oh think I should? Do you think I should divide this podcast up into the uh, uh, what was it six segments and do sure. six separate videos, or do you think we I should just go ahead and add the intro and ending and upload it as one podcast? Honestly, I mean, one podcast would be cool. Um, That's true. Some many ones would be cool too, though. I mean, what do you think would get more hits? All right. Who I don't. I honestly don't know. <laughs> it, it's I, like neither. I, I think what I'll do is I'll upload it as one podcast. Yeah. Um, That's what we, yeah, that makes sense. Next week, what do you do? You want to talk about the bodies in the freezers? I think that's a good next one. That would be a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So for our first podcast of November, we'll be talking about the bodies found in freezers all over the country. Amazing. And were, yeah. weren't there also some found in Canada also? I think so. 
So all over the northern United uh, Northern America. Damn. Yep. So <laughs> that's going to be interesting. I'll have to do some research research on that. But I'm going to go ahead and get off here. Uh, all right. Start this render converting or whatever. Watch Scream with my uh, daughter and my wife. Nice. So next week we'll be uh, taking uh, talking about the bodies in the freezers. Uh, don't forget if you're an author and need a narrator, check out Ben Hunter on ACX. Uh, he authored or he authored he narrated my uh, book Jack the Ripper: The Man Behind the Blade, which is now available on Amazon. Uh, via hardback, paperback, uh, audiobook on Audible, and on ebook. It's a uh, must. You got to get it. It's a must read. Uh, also, I have two new books out now for children. They are children's horror books. Uh, they are part of the uh, Hollow Screams uh, anthology series. Uh, My daughter's addicted already. <laughs> oh. Has she read Ghost House yet? She's she's uh, at chapter six of Ghost House. Cool. cool. Yeah, she's so, loving it. So just look up my name, S.M. Cornthwaite, on Amazon, or I'll put the links in the description. Uh, also, check out Jared's podcast, Masters of the Geek First. Talks about yeah. all things geek culture, awesome. uh, toys, comics, TV shows. And I think I his next episode is going to be talking about power rangers yes seeing the crazy ride this franchise has had in the past what are they up to now like 30 almost no 28 <laughs> they've gone from saban to disney back to saban now they're at hasbro and they've bounced around plus they've got the boom channels. studios comics oh man i love oh, those yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about them moving from Nickelodeon to Netflix and the opportunities that could also open up. Awesome. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Now, so you, if you guys would like to be a part of it, just let me know. Do you have a YouTube channel yet, or is this going to be on Facebook? Uh, I'm going to try to create a uh, <laughs> YouTube channel for it and uh, try to learn a little bit about you know editing and stuff i gotta i gotta get all that well, down but. well come over man i'll show you everything you need to know all right i'm just right. i'm just gonna try so if you guys would like to join that'd be great all right awesome. sounds good uh, uh, cool. so we will see you guys next week right here awesome. on the unnatural thoughts podcast on the psychology of the unknown youtube channel i've been shannon this has been jared and ben we'll see you next time take care everyone if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a single video. Give us a like, leave a comment below, and please share the video with your family and friends. I've been Shannon, and this has been Psychology of the Unknown.